All right. Welcome to another episode of Sand Hill Road. I'm your host, Erasmus Elsner, and this is the show where I talk to the great operator behind the tech companies of tomorrow who are building and scaling companies out there in the wild. And today I have a great guest with me. I have Divian Aurora, who's the co-founder of Byte Kitchen, which is a YC summer 2021 batch company. They've just recently announced a successful $6 million round led by Crosslink Capital, and we're going to talk about it. But Div Young, really happy to have you here with me. Where does this podcast find you today? Thank you, Rasmus. Thank you for, for having me. I, I'm glad to be here. I am in our office in, well, office and first location said Peru. So the kitchen is downstairs. You find me in the room that doubles up as, as the conference room, coffee room, and where we have our packaging. So if there's people that come in and out and grab packaging, I apologize in fast. In the machine room, I love that. As you've just been through the ringer of the fundraising, journey. Give us a two-minute pitch of what Byte Kitchen does, and then we can go into some different aspects and dive a little bit deeper. Yes, we started Byte Kitchen with the singular aim of helping restaurants expand to locations that they did not exist in or that they don't exist in. And the way we're doing it is through a collection of food halls. You know, our consumer-facing name is is Noshery. That's the t-shirt behind me, you know. And what we do is that we partner with existing brick and mortar restaurants. We license their menu, their brand, their, their recipes. We then cook them out of our kitchens fresh and then serve them to consumers under our umbrella at as, as you can see. So right now in San Mateo, we have our first location. We've partnered with eight restaurants, restaurants that you know and, and have heard about, you know, including Orange Hummus, The Melt, The Little Chihuahua, you know, Eastside Bond Meat, Nashville. And then we're serving food to consumers from our restaurants. And then... Every order that we sell, our, our restaurants get a percentage of that. And for the consumers, right, they get to mix and match cuisines from restaurants that they know and they love. Yeah, it's an interesting space. It is part of this cloud or exploding cloud kitchen space. And we're going to get into, into what kind of model you're exactly doing there. But Divian, if I look at your background, it looks like two years ago, if I had talked to you, you would have been a banker in a suit. Talk to us about, you know, your background a little bit. Yes. So my background, you know, I grew up in India and then I moved to the U.S. for my undergrad. So then, you know, the classic so undergrad and then worked in, in management consulting for a couple of years, you know, created a few slide decks and, and hopefully learned something. And then after that, I moved back to India. You know, I worked with, with an organization called Central Square Foundation that was working in, in childhood education and was set up an amazing entrepreneur who you know, started in US first private equity firm. And then, you know, a few years later, I went into philanthropy, which is when he started this. So work from him, learned from him. It was an amazing experience. And, you know, then I came back to the US for my business school. And you're right, after that, I, I went to, do, you know, investment banking for a few reasons. Great training ground and also a great way to pay off a student debt, you know, to, to be candid. And the day that I felt, that, you know, I had, I had a good amount of training, I'd wanted to start something in a related space for, for the longest time. If anything, you know, being an entrepreneur, that had been, you know, on the horizon since as long as I could remember. So, you know, when I became debt free and had just enough savings to sort of, you know, go without any pay for a few months up to a year, I figured that this would be a good time. So that's when we started putting together Five Kitchen, even though the idea had been germinating. My parents have been in public service and growing up, you know, for me, I did not decide to go into public service. So to me, it was, you know, what can I do to contribute in, in, in whatever way, right? Small or meaningful if I'm lucky. And to me, there are very few things that you can do which are as big as generating employment, right? And for me, entrepreneurship was a vehicle to do that. So that's how, you know, I got into that. And frankly, it's hard for me to get excited about flexing LIBOR rates. And then talk about sort of the stage when you applied to YSC. Did you already test the idea? Did you have the idea? Was it a fully fledged idea? And did you have an MVP? What was the state of when you took this leap from your day job? I think it was at Evercore and said, I'm going to go all in with Y Combinator. In fact, there was no safety net in that sense. You know, for me, I have a lot of friends who who sort of tried to start something when they're, you know, when they're at a job, if something works or if they see enough traction or if they get into X Accelerator or Y program. For me, it was not, you know, I knew that at least the, with banking, right? The hours, et cetera. It's almost impossible to be really giving it a real shot, you know, not, not just to say it. So my first co-founder and I were, you know, we're one of the two of three. When we started, like we were out of our jobs, you know, out of our job in the sense that we were not doing anything, which is why it was important to have a little bit of a cushion to survive and to be able to pay rent and eat food. 
So we tested it out for a long time. Actually. I'd say that the idea when we started refining, it was even close to August, September of 2020. You know, that's when I moved to the West Coast, to Mountain View, and my co-founder used to live on the West Coast as well. That's when we really started to work on the idea, started to refine it, you know, spoke with at least a hundred restaurants, right? To talk about the issues, to talk about their problems, to talk about the dissatisfaction with current solutions. And then we felt that we, from our side, had an idea that was at least at an idea level pretty big. That's when we started looking for our third co-founder. And we were very clear that our third co-founder has to be an operator from the restaurant industry and has to be a co-founder not a first employee, not a team member later on, but we wanted to have restaurants and food as part of the DNA of the company. So we started looking for a third co-founder and, you know, we, we tried every channel, you know, recruiters, job description of the CIA, which is the Culinary Institute of America, tried to build up a network and also did it the old fashioned, which is LinkedIn, right? And I still remember when we looked at Quinn's profile, who ended up becoming the third co-founder, you know, we're like, there's no way he's going to respond to a, a random sort of LinkedIn message, but we were like, you know what, let's try it. And I... Hopefully this doesn't get back to LinkedIn, but I have convinced a friend of mine to give me a LinkedIn premium subscription who worked at LinkedIn to save some money on that. So we had unlimited messages at that time. And then, you know, Quinn responded and that's when we got together. So that's how the team got assembled. And then we kept iterating on the idea that, you know, in terms of Y Combinator, you know, it was a classic chicken or the egg problem, right? We figured that we were onto something because we kept hearing the same feedback from restaurant operators, which I'm happy to talk about in detail later, but it's chicken or the egg problem, right? You feel that this could be a very helpful thing if you were able to demonstrate that you could cook food on their behalf, right? Great. Where do you find the kitchen? Well, to find a kitchen, you need capital, right? To find capital, you need some proof of concept, right? So it was the circular loop where to get restaurant partners, you needed to show some sort of MVP, to show some sort of MVP, you needed capital. And to get the capital, you needed to have the other two. You're a classic scrappy. This, by the way, this is still when we were all out of my Boundary apartment, right? At some point in time, it got to five people in in a one-bedroom apartment when we were experimenting with all these ideas, but we were able to find a test kitchen out of a yacht club that was lying vacant. That we, you know, three of us were like, you know what, this is inexpensive enough where we can put our own money to rent it for a month and see what happens. And that's how we started. So we got a kitchen, we started cooking out of that. We started on the chefs. They, you know, agreed to license their brands in the beginning. It's just like a test thing. And that's when the MVP started, started to get formed. And, you know, very thankful to our initial people. That's really cool because, I mean, you're not in the business of moving bits and bytes. You're really in the business of moving atoms and moving food, preparing food, moving food. It's a high CapEx business. So the MVP looks a lot different than that of, of a SaaS company and very different to that of many of the peers at Y Combinator. But it is also a very interesting business model, obviously. And I want to unpack a little bit the business model. There's this classical, I would say, Travis Kalanick cloud kitchen model where you say you're basically just creating your own brands. You have only a, a pure cloud kitchen. Then there's this model where you have an existing in-store dining area. And then basically they start looking into delivery options. They have sort of a cloud kitchen facility. Then there's sort of the stop and spoke model where you have let's say multiple locations of a restaurant, and then you have sort of a hub where you prepare for the cloud or for the delivery agents. And then there's what you do, sort of the multi-brand concept where you have one cloud kitchen, but you're in licensing the recipes from the kitchen partners, which is quite an elaborate, I would say, next generation cloud kitchen. Talk to us a little bit about this emergent space. And for those people who are not familiar with Cloud Kitchen, it's a $1.3 billion funded startup of the Uber founder, Travis Kalanick. He was sort of pioneer in that space. He saw it through Uber and Uber Eats, obviously, that there was a lot of backlog and that there was a real white space when it came to optimizing for location, when it came to optimizing for rents. And the typical concept is that you are in a low rent environment or in a low rent zip code and that you deliver to adjacent Iron areas, but I've taken away too much of the thunder. I'll leave it to you to unpack this really complex emergent space. Don't get us, but it's it's funny, right? You know, when we when we started to analyze everything, when we started by the kitchen, we were similar, right? We were looking at all the different bottles and what would be the most helpful. You know, now it's it's so funny. Now it's so clear in our heads that we throw around terms that don't mean anything to anyone outside the industry. 
but it, within the company, right, everyone knows exactly what we're talking about. So let me take a step back, right? In the general cloud kitchen, ghost kitchen, whatever you want to classify it as industry, there's a separate industry, at least this is how we classify it in our minds, that we call it restaurant expansion, right? We invented this, this classification, so I don't, I don't think you're going to find anything on Google if you write, right, like restaurant expansion. But if you look at restaurant expansion as the largest category of what companies in the space are trying to do, then within that, there's sort of three subcategories. There's, you know, cloud kitchens or ghost kitchens. I don't want to say cloud kitchens because it's a specific company. So if you want to call it, you know, ghost kitchens for reference. The second one is what we refer to as virtual brands. The third one is called licensed brands, right? Like these, these would be the three classifications within that. So we have cloud kitchens, we have virtual brands for ghost kitchens, virtual brands, and, and licensed brands. Now, the first one is what you described, which is one way for restaurants to expand. It's primarily... The service that is being offered is primarily that of real estate. For restaurants, you can take up space in an existing facility, but you're still paying the rent. You are staffing the kitchen in most cases, and you're cooking all the food. The equipment is yours. So effectively, it's a turnkey solution, but you're still doing all the work and you're still paying all the rent, right? It's not asset light for the restaurants. It's more asset light than them starting the next location, right? So that's, that's probably the best way to describe it. So the first one, right, you have, you have companies such as Cloud Kitchens, I believe, you know, Kitchen United, some of the others. The second one is where companies have created their own brands, which they then license to existing restaurants. So let's say, you know, you're running Erasmus's fried chicken and someone comes to you and they say, you know, Erasmus, we noticed that between 2 and 5 p.m., you don't have a lot going on. We're going to license you some sort of marketing back brand where we're going to be doing the marketing and you'll do the cooking and you'll do the fulfillment via the delivery apps, and then you pay us a percentage for licensing this brand, right? You know, Mr. Beast Burger and, and a few others. So in this case, again, the cooking is being done by restaurants. The preparing, the selling, everything is still being done by restaurants. You know, they have to purchase the raw material. It's their equipment. It's their, it's their staff. And then they pay a percentage to the company that has licensed them the brand, right? The third one, finally, right? We come to, we come to what we're up to, which is... From all the conversations that we've had with restaurants, right? For some restaurants, incremental capacity is a mirage, right? If you ever come to a kitchen, if you're not selling between two and five, you're prepping, you're cleaning, you're doing purchasing, you're doing inventory. There's a lot of things that you're doing and you can get hit with an order anytime, right? So it's not that you have just tons of free time lying around, then you can then start cooking for other things. And, and even otherwise, right? You can't change people's eating preferences. It's not like for any other brand, people will start ordering at 4 p.m or 3 p.m. for dinner, right? They still order at the same time, so you still get hit at the same time. So for us, what we're doing is that we are, the model that we have, restaurants do not have to spend a single penny in terms of expanding. So again, let's take the example of Erasmus Fried Chicken. We come to Erasmus and we're like, Erasmus, you know, you have, you, you have an amazing product. You have customers that absolutely love you. When let's say your, your restaurant is successful, and we're like, you know, Erasmus, people in Mountain View love you, people in Palo Alto love you, people in the Bay Area, right? All of these cities, they're clamoring and they drive all the way there. How about we license your brand? So we will license Erasmus's fried chickens. T a terrible example because it doesn't roll off the tongue. We'll start taking a real example after that. You know, Orange Hummus will license their, their brand. We will cook the food. We will purchase the ingredients from the same suppliers that they do. We'll follow their recipes and then we will sell it to consumers. And they get a percentage of every order that we spell. So if there's no CapEx on their part, there's no OPEX on their part. It's incremental revenue, incremental cash flow, whatever you want to call it from day one. And it's a percentage of revenue. It's not a percentage of, you know, adjusted EBITDA or some funky metric like that, right? It's, uh, it's very transparent. It's very clear. So that's, that's what we do. I think this is for the audience really interesting to understand the landscape. And I mean, you mentioned this with the ghost kitchen model then sort of the virtual brands. Then I stumbled in my research on one company called Nextbyte, which is, I believe, doing exactly this category too. Basically, they create their own recipes and then in license that to restaurants and then they cook it in those restaurants when the restaurants have idle space. And what you're doing is another version that you basically, you look at what's working in the brick and mortar businesses, which businesses are really booming and they're in expansion mode, and there's something that's working with their food that we can then bring to the ghost kitchen. And then I assume you really have to train your chefs to really replicate those menus and 
you also need to have a, a pretty large kitchen to have the different sort of kitchen gear. I imagine if it's like a pizza, if you need a special pizza oven or, or a special fryer, maybe talk a little bit about how those early customer conversations went, because on the one hand, you obviously have the customers, the people eating at, ordering the food, but then you also have the partners who need to trust you that you're not diluting their brand in the online world. That, that's absolutely right, Erasmus. For the purposes of discussion, let's say customers as restaurants, consumers as customers that buy, right? We can make that distinction to, to keep it less confusing. So customers, right, which is restaurants, you're absolutely right. This is their life's work, right? They have, they have created these recipes, their brand, like they're in painstakingly over, over years, over decades, right? You would think that, uh, you know, the revenue share would be the, the biggest thing for restaurants, right? But in our conversations, I mean, that's obviously... That is helpful, right? If there's a financial incentive to do this, but the increased brand equity, but rather brand reach, right? Because they want to reach as many consumers as consumers want to reach them, right? So this was the hardest thing. How do you turn over in some ways your life's work and trust us to be in some ways storms of your legacy, right? That you still things that we built. And I think for that, a few things that, that we have to write, like one is that, that our co-founder, Quinn, you know, he comes with. 35 years of restaurant industry experience. And he's maniacally focused on quality. The day we launch a brand, our brand partners come, come to our location to actually test it. Unless it's it distinguishable from the locations that they sell it in, we will not sell that menu item or that brand, right? So it takes a long time in some ways to get our kitchen trained, right? For each and every brand and for the nuances there. So having a co-founder that really knows what they're doing is very helpful. We've created what we call accessible standard operating procedures, where we break down every single recipe into, you know, internal OPs that are then used to train our staff, right? And, and we try to make these as, as easy to follow, but also that keeps the fidelity of the brand completely in place. The third thing is that quality is at the heart of what we do. It's in the forefront of what we do. So we're not offering every single menu item that our partners offer, right? I mean, single. Circle A as, as the greatest hits and circle B as menu items that do not require specialized equipment, which is the fourth point I was going to come to. A intersection B is, is probably what would be a rough way to define the menu items that we sell, right? Because we do not want to sell anything that we don't feel confident we can pull off as well as our brand for. So it's a selection of, I wouldn't say greatest hits. I mean, we do very extensive menus, but it's not covering everything, right? And the last thing which I briefly mentioned is we do not, or at least not yet, we've not taken on cuisines that require specialized equipment for obvious reasons, right? So we're not doing pizza. We're not doing wood fire ovens. At some point in time, we absolutely will. But for now, we've stayed away from that. We're not doing Chinese, you know, because having a walk set up requires a fair amount of infrastructure at the back. And, and you know, it's again, at some point in time, we may do that. But for now, we're not doing it because we're, we're trying to do what, what we could pull off really well, right? So those are sort of the four things that have helped us gain the trust of our brand partners, of our restaurant partners, right? You have there the, the merge of your first location, the nursery behind you. Talk about the last 12 months on setting up really this infrastructure. What does it take? Do you have to recruit specialized chefs? Did you rent it? Did you sublease it from someone else? I mean, it was a lot of heavy lifting in the last couple of months, I can imagine. That's right, Erasmus. So we started our first location in San Mateo in... December of last year, you know, we went through YC and ended around September. And that's when we started our first location to San Mateo, you know, for, for the business model within the atomic world, right? If you want to call it that, this is the most asset light model, right? Which is we're not remodeling kitchens. We're not building kitchens. We're taking over existing second generation kitchens, which means that restaurants used to operate here, right? So the infrastructure is there, you know. Well, infrastructure and everything, right? In some cases, equipment being there, very ready to be permitted because there used to be an existing restaurant until a few months back. So as an example, the San Mateo location, you know, a restaurant would operate until almost July or August, right? And then we took it over in September. So we lease kitchens. We don't buy any real estate. We're not doing any CapEx heavy stuff here, right? There's minimal CapEx that, that you obviously require to get a kitchen up and running. But we've been supremely scrappy about that in terms of setting it up in a very fast and efficient manner. So for a San Mateo location, the kitchen was operational one day after the lease started, which I think is, you know, I haven't gone through lease records, but I would bet that's a record in the restaurant industry, right? In order to get it up and running. That's sort of the YC ethos as well, right? Which is, I don't know the exact words. I mean, I'm not very familiar with these sort of 
you know, quotes in the VC world, but, uh, you know, be scrappy or, you know, try things and fail or break fast. Or, yeah, yeah. Nail it before you scale it. Yeah. <laughs> it's also one. Have one location. Uh, correct. Have one location Sorry. with really strong unit economics. See if you can make it there. Try it out with the first few select partners and then gradually expand to new locations, expand potentially to new partners. We mentioned those that might require specialized infrastructure. What's the next step from your perspective when it comes to expanding the product? Is it on the partnership side? Is it on the location side? Is it on, you know, testing it out in different areas in the U.S.? Or is it San Francisco Bay Area at the moment? What's sort of the plan next step? Right. You're asking us all of the things you mentioned, right? So first thing is expanding geographically, right? So we just opened our second location in San Carlos. Our first location in San Mateo has done really well. And seeing that momentum, as you said, right, nail it or you scale it. Obviously, nailing it is a very subjective term, but the benchmarks and the metrics that we had set for ourselves that would give us, you know, confidence that we're on to something. I think we've we've crossed those in a big way. So that gave us the confidence to start our second location, you know, which is in San Carlos. It opened about four weeks ago, so almost about a month back, and we're having our formal launch and ribbon cutting ceremony this Saturday. So please, you know, if you if you happen to find yourself in San Carlos and and are up for some good food, you know, please come over. That'll be good. So and then, you know, continuing to expand geographically in other, in other locations, starting out with more locations in the Bay Area than California. In addition to that, hopefully enabling more restaurants to expand with us, right? So expanding our restaurant partners that we have. So right now we partner with eight, you know, hopefully that keeps growing as well. So that's another area of expansion. The third one I'd say is that, you know, we've continued to, to build technology for the kitchen. I think that's one of the aspects I want to talk about. And to your point earlier, Alf, you know, you said that we have to train all of our chefs said, do we have to get specialized chefs in this? Actually, no, right? I think the only way to scale or the best way to scale in this case is to have very strong operating procedures, right? You know, McDonald's does not hire specialized chefs or Chipotle does not hire specialized chefs or sweet green. Any restaurant enterprise that has been able to scale has been able to scale on the strength of their operations. And that's what the SOPs are about. That's what all of the playbooks that we're developing within our kitchen is about. And that's what the technology is about, which is you know, digitizing the kitchen. If you look at restaurant tech, right, the the front of the house gets a lot of love, which is customer facing. The kitchen still remains fairly pen and paper, right? So for us, digitizing the kitchen, and I don't mean digitizing in some crazy robotic way, or you know, I'm not I'm not here to talk about those those sorts of things, but but very real things that help us get very much more efficient on a daily basis. Right. So investing in technology on on that side, even more so. And then continuing to grow the team. I mean, one of the things you said, you know, is, is what did it take you to start? I mean, it, it was because we had a phenomenal team in place and we've been able to attract early team members that are amazing, that are rock stars, both in the kitchen and, and in non-kitchen areas. And we continue to look to expand that, you know, that, you know, at the end of the day, right, at, that's, that's the bread and butter of, of any company. And indulge me for a second here, as I try to understand sort of the perfect partners that you're looking for on the partner restaurant. Let's let's take a restaurant. It's a famous Berkeley, UC Berkeley pizza place. They're sort of a branded Berkeley. If the Berkeley graduates move to San Francisco and they still want to have that pizza, that's sort of your perfect partner, which is not fully local in terms of expansion mode. So not, you know, like another location within Berkeley, but close enough so that people have a brand recognition when they see it as a food for order option. It's more like the ones that, that are sort of at this hyper-local tipping point to going multi-location, right? Yeah, great, great question you're asking. You know, for for our restaurant partners, uh, you know, let, let's take let, let's take sort of three types of restaurant. You know, you can you can obviously classify it by by any number of types. But there's let's call them experiential restaurants, right? We're probably not we're probably not the right company to be working with experiential restaurants. It's hard it's hard to deliver the experience right in a box or or, or pick up or take out. Even though actually one of the things you said about, you know, us being ghost kitchen. So actually we, we, we almost call ourselves, I mean, you know, not the anti-ghost kitchen, but really the anti-ghost, right? Because we're not, there's nothing ghost about us. We're not, we're not trying to minimize rent and be in, be in areas that are just completely not visible or, you know, we're not, our kitchens are not in some, some place that you can't see, right? We are, we are in places where you can actually physically come in order at the kiosk and pick up and actually eat there as well now. So, and, and food is not fresh, so you can actually see that happening. You know, so that, that's a big, I think that's a big differentiator, which I should have, which I should have talked about. But again, 
experiential restaurants, no chains. You know, frankly, I think they can they can do this on their own for us. The most exciting part is enabling restaurants that are in the hearts of their communities, right? That have that have a phenomenal product, and people come from all over, all over, you know, local areas or or regional areas to to eat at those places, right? And there's a demand for for their food because of the fan following that they have. You know, those would be those would be the sweet spot. So I'd say, you know, there's there's no right number, but you know, anywhere from one to maybe you know five, seven, eight to ten locations, they might purchase. Gotcha. And from the customer side, we haven't talked about actual consumers of the product. There's also a great benefit because they can sort of mix and match their orders, so they can have hummus next to I don't know a burger. So they're much more flexible in putting their orders together, right? Yeah. So one thing. You know, and I'm sure you've personally felt this, right? If you've ordered for, for the office or for your family, people have different tastes and preferences and somewhat or the other inevitably settles, right? And in order to not settle, you have to order from multiple places, which is not a seamless ordering experience at all. You know, they food arrives at different times. You have to put in multiple orders. It's not, there's not one seamless way of doing it. So for us, that, that was a challenge that, that we wanted to solve, you know, let's say you want a burger from the mouth because that's what you're craving. And someone else in your family, right? They're looking for Mediterranean food, as you said, and someone else is looking for Mexican food and, and someone's looking for vegetarian food, right? All of those options are available in, a, in the same court. You know, family of four, they can order different things. If you want an order for the office, you want a catering order, they can order items that, that are diverse. And these are all, again, you know, just want to read it. These are all from thin brick and mortar restaurants that you've heard about that, that, that your family members have heard about, heard about or, or bid to and that your colleagues have bid, right? So that, yeah, so it's, it's the cross ordering on our platform has been, you know, we came in with this thesis that we'd love to offer the mix and match service to, to consumers. And, and we would really, we were really hoping that, that, that this would take off and, and people would see value in it. And, and it's been, it's, it's, it's been way beyond what we expected, right? So this show is a show where I talk to both founders and venture capitalists. And as you've just cleared a $6 million funding round led by Crosslink Capital, Emerging Ventures, and I think existing investors like Correlation Ventures, Soma Ventures. It has been a really tough fundraising environment in the last couple of weeks. And you managed to close that round, and it's a round not for an 80% gross margin SaaS business, but for one that, that really does require some, some part lifting on your end. Maybe unpack a little bit the fundraising process, how you got convinced investors that this was really a venture scale business rather than another ghost kitchen business. Yeah. So, you know, I, I won't speak on their behalf, right? Because I'm, I'm sure that they have, they have their investment thesis and uh, they would be the best people to answer those, that, that question. But from our side, right, I can tell you what, what I think was, was helpful and, and, and what they saw. I think, you know, Erasmus, yes, it's not, it's not an 80% Go smart in business, but the TAM is absolutely massive, right? I mean, everyone's got to eat. That's 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 one thing. And and within that industry, if you look at the existing relationships of restaurants with food tech companies, and and I'm putting everyone in the food tech world, there's always a lot of friction because it's always incentives are not aligned, right? Restaurants either have to pay the fees or you know they have to do the work. So in, in terms of the actual work or operations, right? They're they're the ones doing it. So so it's never worth them to pay a rent, but but in all cases, it's them in some ways paying a cut, right? Whether it's through work or, or through actual money. This is the first this is the first time where restaurants don't have to do that, and our restaurant partners can expand without like spending any money, right? And and I think the thesis that our investors see behind this is that long term, when the industry shakes out, the business models that are going to remain are the ones where your customers, which is in this case restaurants, and and the service provider, which is us share a relationship where incentives are completely aligned, right? I think long-term, that's very important. Otherwise, there's always, there's always friction and there's a lot of churn. So, so that's one. And I think in terms of operating businesses, right? I, I mean, I hate using sort of these large company analogies because there's somewhere implicit in that, right? That we're going to be the next Amazon or we're going to be the next, you know, Tesla or what have you, right? Like, you know, obviously no one knows, no one knows the future in that sense. But if you look at companies that are built on operations, they've, they've, there's there's examples of you know companies that are that are bigger than trillion dollar companies that are not necessarily the 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 eighty I mean the eighty percent SaaS gross margin right the businesses so there's massive businesses to be built in any category I think it's important for for you to know you know who your investors are and 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 what they 
you know, what they're investing in, right? You know, for some investors, there will be multiple sort of criteria that, you know, that they will only invest in certain sectors, et cetera. And for some investors, it's, it's very simple, right? They want to invest in businesses that are category defining businesses and that can grow up to be best, right? And, and I think that's the bet as you're such a humble man, you probably didn't mention it again, the traction that you probably had in that first location that you really did nail it before you're now going to scale it. Talk a little bit about sort of cohorts, cohort retention, repeat customers ordering the same food and being really happy on the delivery of the product. Yeah. So you're right, Erasmus, you know, sort of very specific metrics aside, right? All of these things that you just mentioned, they've obviously been super positive, which is why investors have also been, you know, very happy to back us, right? In terms of, you know, starting with, starting the top line, right? And, and, and everything, the strength so far, so the top line, right? That's, that's indicative of obviously product market fit, which means that the customers actually do want what you're selling. You know, even beyond that, if you take a step back, the fact that we've been able to partner with such household names in terms of restaurants, right? That's a very strong sign. In fact, it shows that this is a business model that restaurants can get behind and that they care about, right? You know, knock on wood, we've had every single restaurant that has partnered with us. They've stayed here because they can see that this works really well. You know, in terms of unit economics, obviously, that remains a focus and we've been razor focused on that. So, you know, balancing both growth Unit economics, and as you said, cohort metrics, right? The right from you know, customer acquisition to customer retention, to repeat ordering, to reviews, you know, on third-party platforms, including, you know, the websites you can, you can see that, right? Like those, those have been super positive. So, so it's early days, but we've had very strong traction. And, you know, we hope to continue delivering on that. And we talked about sort of the use of funds. You're planning on opening the next location. We're actually opening it this weekend already. And then you're investing further in the technology. Talk a little bit about sort of this technology angle. We talked about sort of, you know, getting the standards right, getting the operating models right, but talk about the tech aspect by kitchen. Yeah. So, you know, I'd start off by saying that our, our, our kitchens are, you know, fully autonomous and we're cooking food completely low code, you know, and we're doing, we're doing drone deliveries on a daily basis. So, so it's like the most futuristic kitchen of all time. No, I'm joking. Actually, not the low, not, not the no code part because we are actually cooking the food in, in a no code way, but no, we're not, you know, we're not, we're not doing drone deliveries or anything. So you're asking us in terms of technology, our thesis is very clear. The technology that we build is twofold, one on the customer facing side and the other for our kitchens on the customer facing side, you know, it, 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 that was some ways fairly simple. It's, it's the way for consumers to interact with us, right? So be it the website, the web app, the app, you know, that, that, that they've been working on. So. That, that, that's the customer side. The, the other part of it is, you know, at least internally, we almost two years, right? We've, we've called it the kitchen operating system, right? So kitchens are the heartbeat of restaurants, right? So from the moment a customer places an order to the moment that the order is fulfilled, there's a lot of processes I can throw in another tech for their microservices, right? There's a lot of microservices that go on within the kitchen while all of this is happening, right? Some of them are fairly obvious, right? Like purchasing, right? Like purchasing raw material, inventory, prepping, what are the most urgent tasks? When should that happen, right? Staffing the kitchen, scheduling, all of those. A lot of that still happens with pen and paper. And to run kitchens in the most efficient manner, we're trying to integrate everything in the back of the kitchen to then have it be run very simply, right? Because if you're doing eight brands and you're doing it in multiple locations, it's not an easy operation to run. But the technology actually ends up making us much more efficient as a company, right? So we're not trying to build, you know, technology for investors or to be labeled as a tech company, right? There are real operational efficiencies, massive ones that you see from digitizing the kitchen and having, you know, this kitchen operating system. So that's the tech element of what we do. And, you know, who knows in five years, right? When changes happen, we have our calls to this, to the market in terms of automation. It is a small process to make things very efficient. And obviously that's only going to improve as time. I love it with the operating system and the different containerized micro services within the, within the kitchen. Correct. And so as we're running against the, the clock, Divian, maybe it's time for the call to action. Where can people find out more about your company, what you're up to, where can they order the food most importantly, and which cities are you coming next to and who should come by and, and see you at your location? Thank you. Thank you, Rasmus. Just wanted to thank you for giving, giving me this opportunity you know, to be on the podcast. So our, our website is ordernoshery.com. That's O-R-D-E-R-N-O-S-H-E-R-Y.com. So that's where you can order. 
You can, you can obviously find us on third-party delivery apps and everywhere else as well. Or you could come in to our locations and, and order in person. So we have two locations. There's Nauchery San Mateo and then there's Nauchery San Carlos. The one in San Mateo is 5 South Ellsworth Avenue. And then the one in San Carlos is 1754 Laurel Street. So those are the two that we have. You know, one is invited. If anyone wants to come to. I love it. I love it. Now we have a real address to come and see the company and, and see where the magic happens. And about you personally, where can people follow you? But yeah, Erasmus, I'm not on any uh, social media, actually. So, so uh, probably not follow me anyway. But in terms of, you know, what we do as a company, fightkitchen.io is our website. That's B-Y-T-E-K-I-T-C-H-E-N.io. And, you know, to reach me, please reach out to uh, founders at uh, bytekitchen.io. Perfect. Perfect. 